we pray that you'll bless our, our uh, time here. We pray that you'll surround us with your angels and your Holy Spirit and help us to, to really receive a blessing, thinking that the Sabbath is coming. And we pray that we can be blessed and encouraged and strengthened and have really blessed communion with you this Sabbath day. We pray that you'll guide as we're sharing the stories of what you've done in our lives. And we pray that it can be a real blessing to others, that, that it'll be uh, your, your voice heard and, and uh, us. we pray that, that you'll help us to, to know how to accomplish what you have for us in your work. We thank you so much. We pray this all in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Okay. So, um, like I said, um, when I was young, uh, my parents would read us mission stories uh, at family worship. And so that was kind of where my desire to do mission work started. Uh, that was real instrumental in, in my, my younger years. And it took like, it was when I was a teenager that I actually gave my, my life to God for myself. And then like all the things that they'd read to me when I was young, that's when my desire started when I actually gave my own life to God. And then I, because of all the things that, that they had read to us, that's kind of where, where it all came from. Like the, the Bible verse, um, raise up a child in the way he should go. And when he's old, he'll not depart from it. Mm -hmm. And so that was an important thing in my life. And um, so when I was a teenager, I think I was about 16, 17, I can't remember for sure, but uh, I was trying to decide, I was kind of at the age where kids normally would go and get a job and start making money. And, and like, in my mind, I, I wanted to make some money so I could buy a vehicle, like a, a pickup or something. And I wanted a, a watercraft, like a canoe or a kayak. And so those were my, my dreams of what I wanted to buy if I earned some money. And so I was trying to decide. Uh, my parents were working on this lifestyle center uh, here in about a little ways north of here. And uh, so I was trying to decide, should I keep helping them or should I go do the normal thing and get a job like kids normally do? And uh, so I was praying about it and praying if I should just spend my time helping them or, or what I should do. And so I decided to go ahead and help them um, continue helping them with the lifestyle center. And this is a picture. This is from one of my first digital cameras. It's a blurry old picture from <laughs> uh, when it was not totally finished, but uh, so we, were, we spent about seven years working on building this, this building. And so I decided to go ahead and continue helping them. And I knew I wasn't gonna get paid there. And so I, I was just praying and I said, Lord, I'll go, I'll work for you if you'll take care of me. And I didn't really have a particular thing in mind. It wasn't like I was bartering with him or anything like that, but it was interesting that over the next few years, uh, he gave me um, five vehicles and five different boats. Uh, so he supplied five times as much as what I was hoping to get, thinking about if I got a job. These are just a few of the pictures of some of the, the boats that he gave me. And all of these were for free. And all the vehicles were free. Those are, those are just a few of them. That's not all of them. But uh, so it was, it was kind of to encourage my faith, I think. He was, I was just starting out, just trying, learning to trust him. And he was just encouraging me that if you work for me, I can take care of you. So that was kind of the start. That was, that was a big thing in my life when I was young. And then uh, as I got older, uh, I went and did some call portering. And Ellen White talks about how call portering is one of the best trainings for doing ministry. And so that was, that was really good. It was very helpful. I did a, one of the summer call portering programs on Michigan. They had a really good um, program out there. And it was very, very helpful getting the training from them and then going out and having the experience of teleporting. And then I went and took the lifestyle educator training course at UC Pines after that. So I, when I was teleportering, uh, the money that I earned from that, I used to go to UC Pines. And while I was at UC Pines, of course, I was getting lots of good training and everything. 
And I also, at that time, that was the first time I'd heard about David Gates. Somebody, I think, gave me a cassette tape or something about one of his sermons. And I was really inspired by hearing his stories of going out and doing mission work and everything. And how they just, he and his family just went out and they just started doing mission work and they didn't have, they were just working as volunteers. They didn't have an assured income and they were just going to trust in God's promises. They went out into the jungle and did volunteer mission work and, and all the stories of how God took care of them and provided for them. And so that was really inspiring to me. And it was shortly just after that, I heard that he was going to be the keynote speaker at one of the regional GYCs for that area. And there was a group of students from Michi Pines going up to the GYC, the regional GYC. And uh, so I went along and got to hear him in person. And he was telling stories about George Mueller too. And when I was young, I'd heard about George Mueller on some of our uh, Bible story or our um, Your Story Hour or something. I can't remember which tapes we had about George Mueller. And so I was hearing George, st stories of George Mueller again as well and how he, he and David Gates both, like they just, when God put opportunities, they saw needs and opportunities and they just went for them, regardless of whether they had the funds already in hand, regardless of whether they already had the assured backing um, to do it, they just trusted God to provide the funds for it and just went ahead with whatever opportunities came. And God just has done amazing things through George Mueller a long time ago and, and the things God did with David Gates ministry. And so I was hearing all these things, and it was interesting, too, that about that time, I was thinking about George Mueller and his stories, and somebody brought a book, box of books to the, the church at Uchi Pines, and they were just giving them away to anybody that wanted them. So I started looking through the box, and here was George Mueller's autobiography, uh, another uh, biography about him by one of his friends, and then a small book, kind of a summary of his stories. And so there I got three different books about George Mueller there at the Ichi Pines Church. Um, so I was, as I was taking the training, I was also thinking ahead to like, what am I gonna do once I'm didn't, done with the training here? And uh, what does God want me to do? And I was thinking about this kind of, of way of doing ministry, just going out and, and just going for whatever opportunities, whatever open doors, whatever needs there are, just going forward with it, regardless of whether you have funds already in place to back you up. And that was, it was exciting. It was also kind of scary because you're not supposed to be able to live without money. <laughs> like you need to have an assured income. You need to have something, something to, to assure you that you're going to have money to live on if you just you go out and do ministry work. And um, so I was thinking about the possibility of like going out and doing some mission work where I didn't have like an assured income and, so I was praying about that and I wasn't sure like uh, what, what God wanted me to do. And it was kind of a, a lot of turmoil in my mind. I was really praying about it and wondering, is that really possible? It seemed to work for David Gates. It seemed to work for George Mueller. And so I was really wondering, like, is this really possible? And uh, somebody at the Uchi Pines Church, they preached a sermon about, uh, is it really like they were preaching about Peter walking on the water and in my mind, I was thinking about these stories I was hearing about, like George Mueller and David Gates and different people like that. I was, I was thinking about those kinds of things, and I was thinking about the story of Peter walking on the water. And it's impossible to walk on water; you can't do it. And just like it's kind of, it's like impossible to, to live and do ministry with no assured financial support. Uh, but Peter asked Jesus. He said, "If that's really you, tell me to come to you." And so Jesus said, yeah, come. And um, so I was thinking about that. And I was thinking, like, uh, what should I, should I be attempting this as well? And I was praying about, like, as I was getting ready to start doing ministry after finishing the training there at Yuchi Pines, uh, what kind of ministry should I do? And so I was praying about this. And I was walking through the library at Yuchi Pines. And I was asking God the question, I was saying, is it really possible to walk on water? Thinking about doing this type of ministry. So I asked him that question, is it really possible to walk on water? And as I asked that question, I looked over at the bookcase and there was a book there that I hadn't seen before. And the title was, of course you can walk on water. And that was, that was a shock to me. That was like, I felt like God's voice just spoke to me. <laughs> and it was like, 
the most immediate answer that I've ever had from God, pretty much. And to think that it was almost like God's voice telling me, of course you can walk on water. You don't have to, you don't have to worry. It is possible. And so that, that was a real insp inspiration to me. And so I thought, I felt like that was God's encouragement to start going forward, start planning on doing this kind of ministry. <clears throat> not, not necessarily um, just do whatever God puts in your path. Don't worry about if you already have an assured financial support to do it. So after I finished at Uchi Pines, I went and I started doing Bible work in Louisiana. And there I had a little bit of a stipend. It was um, working for the conference. So I had a little stipend. It wasn't very much, uh, but it was enough to live on. And so um, I thought, like, when I was hearing the stories of George Mueller and David Gates and things like that, I thought if I started doing that, I would just jump in with both feet and, and immediately be working with millions of dollars. And like I was hearing about David Gates buying television stations and radio stations and airplanes and all this stuff and people donating millions of dollars to do all these things. And so I was thinking that kind of thing would just start happening right away. But God knew I needed training first. I wasn't, I wasn't ready for that kind of thing. Kind of like uh, Moses in the wilderness. He wasn't ready to lead the people of Israel yet. He had to go to the wilderness for quite a while first. And uh, so God kind of led me a little at a time. First, I had a little small stipend. And then after I was done with Bible work in Louisiana, then I went and did mission work in Puerto Rico. And there it was just stepping out by faith because I didn't have any financial support there. Um, there was a place that I could live. So I had a, a place to live, but I still had bills and food and everything I needed. And so that was kind of the next level of training. I had to learn, I had to start trusting God. There I was just, just going there with no, I wasn't working for any organization. I was just going there to do whatever God opened the way for me to do. And so there I had to start learning to live on almost nothing. And that was God's training for me first was to learn to live on almost nothing. And I hadn't really imagined that that was the way it was going to be first. I was thinking I was going to have lots of money to work with uh, when I started doing ministry. And so instead, God, God taught me to live on almost nothing. And that was very valuable later. Here's the, the house that I was living in. So I, I had a nice place to live. So that was free. And it was really amazing, like how God took care of me just in amazing ways. Uh, it was always something different. Like, money would come just at the right time, just at the last minute. Every time I needed it, money would come just at the time I needed it. And it was, it was really amazing. People would like, people I didn't even know would like drive up with food or uh, people would send money just like right when I needed it. And um, a lot of, there was various things I learned, but one of the things I learned was not to depend on humans. If somebody like sent money for several months in a row, I would start to think, okay, I can I can expect this. And then suddenly they'd stop sending money, right? When I started expecting it to keep coming. And so it was like God was trying to teach me, don't depend on humans. I'm the one supplying it. And so anytime I started trusting in a human source, then suddenly that would dry up and it would come from some other source instead. And so I learned, uh, don't de depend on humans, but depend on God. and he kept providing every time, every time it was something different and it wasn't anything I could depend on. So he was really stretching my faith. That was kind of the, uh, that was the biggest test, I guess, where I, I really had to start learning to trust him a lot. And, and it was, I had to trust him up to the very last minute and he would usually provide at the very last minute. Um, so after I moved from, Puerto Rico, I came back to the United States. And when I was in Puerto Rico, there was an average population of a thousand people per square mile. And so when I came back to the United States, I wanted to get out in the country because uh, there wasn't much for country in Puerto Rico. Uh, there was a little bit, but it was still people surrounding you on every side. Um, so I looked up the least populated counties in the whole United States and Catherine County, New Mexico came up as one of the least populated counties in the United States. And so I was coming back with like, I think maybe I had four suitcases coming back. I can't remember. I went down to Puerto Rico with 10 suitcases because I was moving down there with everything, including the car and the dog and everything. 
And when I came back, I think I only could bring back four because I didn't have much money to pay for extra luggage. So I had the, I had the car, I was able to bring the car back and I had just what I could fit in the car and I had $300 in my pocket. And I was going out to New Mexico. Somebody had helped me to, they paid for me to go out there and find a place to live um, so that I could get settled in back in the United States. So I had $300 in my pocket and I needed a house, I needed land to live on. I wanted to live in the country if possible. And of course, furnishings and all the different things that you need if you're gonna start living somewhere. And I didn't have a regular income. I was planning to keep doing ministry uh, like I had been. And so it was really kind of stepping out of faith again, trying to find a place with when you have no money, not even enough to rent. And I found out when I got there that everything was really expensive. And so I didn't know what I was going to do for sure. And the same work that I do, be witness of me. Bridget, can you put the widow? Uh, mute yourself. That's the will of his father. Bridget, let's see here. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah, thank you. Um, yeah, so I got there and, and found out that everything was really expensive. Renting was expensive. Um, buying something was super expensive. And I thought, well, maybe I can find a the, the shell of a junk van that doesn't run anymore at the junkyard and, and like haul that somewhere and, and live in an old van or something and found out that was even too expensive. I couldn't even afford that. And so I didn't know what I was gonna do. I was there for like uh, two weeks. Oh, here's the picture of the car coming there. Looked a little bit like a gypsy. Uh, that was all that I had. Um, yeah, part of the reason I'm telling this is because there's a lot of people I wanted to especially tell the story because there's a lot of people in the same kind of situation. They want to get into the country and they, they feel the need for it, but they're, it's very hard to do it. And it, a lot of people, even if they have an income, they, it's just really hard. It costs a lot to buy land and it's just hard to get into the country. And so for me, I was kind of at the ultimate extreme of having very little to work with to try to move into the country. And, uh, I needed miracles and just about everybody else that moves to the country now needs miracles too, because it's just hard. And, but we know we need to get into the country. And so that's, that's something a lot of people are dealing with right now. And I don't, I want to mention that I don't necessarily recommend that people do what I did. Um, Ellen White talks about being wise, not moving unwisely. Uh, in my situation, I didn't have anything more to work with. So I had to just do with what I had. So. Um, if somebody has opportunity to make better plans than I did and do something a little more stable, especially if they have a family, I think that's better. But in my situation, this was all I could do. Um, so for about two weeks, I was there in New Mexico looking for a place. Nothing was turning up. Uh, it was like no doors were opening. And so I just finally gave up trying to look for something. And I just there was a lot of ministry work that needed to be done. As I was going around the area, I was meeting different people um, and getting to know different people and seeing their needs and things. And so there was a lot of ministry work to do. And I, I had a few books along, a few culprit books. So I took those and I just started going around the neighborhood. It was a little tiny town. Uh, so I just started going around the neighborhood and trying to sell books. And um, it's very interesting that the people that I met doing the ministry was the people that later helped God provided through those kind of those people that I had met while I was doing that. And so finally, after about two weeks, um, I decided I remembered how David Gates had said that uh, one of the things, one of his experiences when he was waiting for God to provide for it was a TV station or radio station, and it was almost at the deadline and none, the money hadn't come in. And it was like God told him. Praise me for what I'm going to do. You've lasted me long enough. Now you need to praise me for what I'm going to do, even though you haven't seen anything happen yet. And so that's what I decided to do. I decided I'm going to praise God for what he's going to do, even though I haven't seen anything happen. And so I started doing that. I started just the whole day I spent thanking him and singing and singing songs of praise to him for whatever he was going to do, even though nothing was happening. And it was by the end of that day, uh, God provided 200 acres of land for me to live on. It was a friend of a friend whose family lived nearby. They had bought this land. Uh, later, I found out it was worth about a million dollars. 
Um, at the time they bought it, like many years before, it was a lot cheaper, I'm sure. But they had tried to live there, they tried to homestead, and they gave up and moved to the city. But they still owned this land and nobody was using it. And they said, you can just go live there, you can use it as long as you want, you can do anything you want to there. And God also provided me a bus. I was able to buy a bus for $100 from an Amethyst guy that lived in the area. Uh, he and his wife had converted it to an RV to go to camp meetings with. He sold it to me for $100, which was very cheap. Um, but he, probably because I was doing ministry work, uh, he wanted to help me out. And through the people that I had met while I was going around doing call portering and doing ministry in the area, uh, God provided a whole load of firewood because I was going to be out there in the middle of nowhere with a wood stove. And he provided a bed and a trailer to haul the bus on because the bus didn't run, so it had to be hauled on a trailer up to the land. And this land was about an hour away from where I was staying. And so by the end of that day, God had provided everything that I needed to live in New Mexico. And I still needed a wood stove. Um, so I found a wood stove on Craigslist. It was like 100 years old, but it was still working condition. And I was able to get that for $75. And that was up in Albuquerque. So when I went up to Albuquerque, I also went to Walmart and uh, to get some supplies and some food. I knew I needed like axe and splitting mall and different things like that um, to to like cut, split my wood. And I needed coolers to keep my food in and water jugs to haul water because I was going to be living with no running water or anything. And uh, so uh, I was going to Walmart to to buy all this stuff. And I needed to buy all this equipment and then I needed some food too, because I was out of food. So I had a, about a hundred dollars left and all of that was gonna need to be used between the supplies and the food. So I knew I, knew I wasn't gonna get much food um, by the time I got all the, the equipment. So I loaded my car with all the water bottles and the cooler and all the equipment. And, and I was going through the aisles at Walmart and I, I came around the, the end of this aisle and met some guys from the church about, it was about like two and a half hours away. I'd gone to this church and I'd met some people there and I came around the corner of Walmart, two and a half hours from where they lived and met them in the aisle at Walmart. And one of the guys said, hey, Sean, um, when my wife and I got married, uh, we, we had both had camping equipment and we've got more than we need now. And so we wanted to give you some. And it was, the camping equipment was water bottles and coolers and ax and splitting mall. And it was the exact things I'd come to Walmart to buy. Mm -hmm. And so I, I took all that stuff back, put it back on the shelves. And then I was able to spend my hundred dollars on food instead of having to buy all the camping supplies. And so um, after that, like I, I got my wood stove back, set it all up. And uh, here's the little bus, the load of firewood. I had a chimney coming out the side of the the wall there. And so it's the $300 and God provided everything that I needed to live there in New Mexico. This is the property. Um, it was a beautiful place way out in the middle of nowhere. Like definitely like there was more, more um, elk in the county than there are people. And I like there was herds of elk walking around. Uh, there's the hundred year old wood stove. It worked pretty good. It kept that place toasty warm. Wow. And that's the bed. It was a very compact living situation, but it worked. And I, I actually really liked it. And it ended up, I'd come there right before winter, which is like the worst time to move to the country right before winter is going to start. And it ended up being the worst winter they'd had for 30 years. And normally don't get a lot of snow there, but this year there was a lot of snow. But I was toasty warm inside the, the bus. And I'd sometimes open the back door because it was so hot in there. I'd be cooking my cereal in the morning or whatever, my food on the wood stove. And it was heating the bus up so much that I'd open all the windows, open the back door. So I'd be sitting there and eating my breakfast, and looking out at the mountains with the snow falling around outside the open door. So it was a lot of fun. And I could see like all the way around in all directions off the bus windows and uh, 200 acres of land out there. I just loved it out there. Mm. But it was a lot of work. And uh, it was, took a lot of work to, to survive out there. I had to haul my water, split the wood. It was kind of a constant job and I wasn't getting as much time to do ministry anymore. I didn't have electricity, so I had to run the car to power the computer. And so it wasn't, I wasn't accomplishing as much ministry. 
And so later on, God provided a cabin to live in. After that winter, then some friends had a cabin in the area and they told me I could live there. And then there I had internet, electricity and everything. So that was a real blessing. And I was able to do more ministry again there. Um, and during my time in New Mexico, there again, like there wasn't anybody, there wasn't like I had a bunch of supporters or anything like that. It was kind of like in Puerto Rico. When I went to Puerto Rico, not a lot of people knew I had gone down there. It wasn't like I had a big support base here in America to send me funds to live on. Uh, the people down there were poor. Uh, so I, I had to trust God because I w couldn't expect the people there to provide for me. Not too many people from America knew I was down there doing mission work. Uh, I was kind of isolated. So it was just me and God and God took care of me there. And then moving to the wilderness in New Mexico again, it was kind of just me and God. And a few people knew I was doing ministry out there, but uh, I was doing most of it online, so it wasn't like a lot of people saw what I was doing. It was mostly to people out, out somewhere else that, that didn't know where I lived or anything. And uh, so God taught me a lot during that time. Um, so many times, both in Puerto Rico and in New Mexico, I was kind of living on the very edge. Like just, he'd give me enough, enough money, enough food just to last. And then uh, maybe a week or a week and a half, two weeks, something like that. And and then I'd be running out of food. I'd be having like one day's worth of food left. And maybe I was on my last day. I even fasted one day because I'd totally run out of food, but fasting never hurt anybody. <laughs> and uh, at the last minute, he'd provide food. He, or he'd send money, provide food. There were so many different ways that he provided. And a lot of times like somebody with somebody somewhere would send an email saying, hey, I, I just sent you some money on PayPal or, or I put money in your bank account or, um, different things or like sometimes people would send money that I hadn't even heard from for like years like I don't know how they got my address I don't know how they knew that I was out there doing ministry or needed money or anything like that um, there was times when like people would drive up with food right when I had run out and they had been at town like two and a half hours away and they had decided to buy a whole supply of food for me like a whole truckload of food and bring it back and uh, there was times when I'd totally run out of food. All the food in the house was gone. And I'd searched the cupboards. Everything was empty. And then I'd be searching again the second time. And suddenly, like, one of the containers suddenly had food in it. And I was sure that it had been empty before. And I don't know if angels just put it there or if they just made it so I didn't find it the first time. But uh, I kind of think maybe they just filled the food containers when I needed it. Uh, there was even times when money would appear. Uh, there was one time several different times that I wanted to go to camp meetings to have fellowship and things. And I had enough money to get there, but not enough money to get home. One time I started driving there to a camp meeting and I got halfway and suddenly I realized that I didn't have the money to even get there. And right at that time I stopped and I prayed. And just then somebody called on the phone and said, Hey, I was driving by the bank, felt impressed to put money in your bank account. And so then I had enough money to go the rest of the way. And at one of the camp meetings, um, during at the end, towards the end of the camp meeting, I was uh, reached into my coat pocket, and here was two hundred dollars in my coat pocket that I hadn't had before. So I don't know if a person put it there; that's a possibility, or if an angel put it there. But then shortly after that, I went to get my financial booklet to find out if I had enough money to get back home again to figure out what what I had to work with. And I opened up the I had the financial booklet in the glove compartment of my car in amongst all the owner's manuals and paperwork and all kinds of different stuff. I had a whole stack of stuff in there. And it was just this common ordinary notebook that was just stuck in there. It didn't have any markings. Nobody would know what it was. And I went to get that and I pulled it out and opened it and $200 fell out of there too. And I hadn't had $200 in there. And it would be really strange for somebody to open my car door, open the glove compartment and randomly stick it into all the the papers that were in that glove compartment and happened to get it into my financial booklet. Uh, nobody would recognize what it was. So I don't know if an angel put it there or if somebody did somehow get it there. I don't know what happened, but it definitely wasn't something I had before. Um, so yeah, just story after story. I've, I could tell stories for hours of all the different uh, experiences of how God provided funds, provided food, uh, just in amazing ways. Uh, these are some of the pictures. This is one of the times somebody had gone to town and they brought this whole vehicle load of food back for me. 
and showed up right when I had run out of food. And I hadn't talked to him for a long time. Like I, what, I wasn't in contact with people. I wasn't telling anybody that I was out of food or needed money or anything like that. And I would just pray and tell God what I needed. And then he impressed different people to send funds or to buy food. And it was kind of neat too, because I had my dog and uh, God would provide food even for my dog. And that the, the bag down at the bottom of the picture there, um, that's a bag of dog food that the people had bought for my dog. They, just, they bought food for me and for my dog. So God even cared about my dog, made sure she always had enough too. Uh, this is one of the containers that I was sure was empty and then suddenly food appeared in it. That's another container that I'd been sure was empty and suddenly it was full of millet. Um, sometimes God would provide like so much food that I didn't have a place to put it all. Like my fridge and freezer were totally full and I, the neighbors even gave me a small, another small refrigerator because sometimes I had more food than I could fit in. Uh, they were giving me stuff out of their garden too. And uh, so they gave me a refrigerator to store stuff in. So it was just amazing experiences how God provided um, during that time. And then after I had been in uh, New Mexico for a while, I was there about six years, I think. And then God uh, opened the way for me to go to India. And there's a whole lot of miracle stories about that too. But uh, we don't have time for all of them right now. But uh, we, we were thinking, my parents and I were, they'd, my parents had kind of started the mission work over in India when they were there. And they had been um, there about 10 years before. And so they wanted me to go back and check on things, make sure it was all still going well. And so we were thinking, Maybe I could take a video camera over there and record some videos and we could put them on YouTube. And we thought that's free. We could, we could do that. And uh, so shortly after I got there, we found out that it's really cheap to go on satellite television. And so we started recording um, TV programs to go on satellite. Actually, it was on cable television first. And then later, uh, we got open the way for us to go on satellite television. And it, it's still expensive, but God keeps providing for years now. He's been providing for us to be on satellite television. This is the area that the satellite covers. So it's focused mainly on India, but it covers all those other countries as well. And the programming's in Hindi and Telugu, which are the two biggest languages of India. And uh, now the satellite signal is downlinked by the last list I saw was 123 cable channels that are downlinking the signal. And I read that one of those channels has 100 million subscribers. So they, this channel downlinks from satellite and then rebroadcasts through their cable system. And they have 100 million subscribers, which is a third of the population of the United States. So I don't know how many people are watching. Um, that's just one of the cable channels and there's many others that downlink it. And then there's all the people that get it from the satellite. So I don't know, God is doing amazing things. I, I never imagined that that would be happening, that we'd be on satellite television for that many people. And he keeps providing for it. Every three months we have to pay and uh, he keeps providing for it month after month. Um, and then when I got back from India, Megan and I got married and this was our wedding. We had our wedding in the tabernacle. Um, I was dressed as the high priest and Megan was dressed as the, like the bride in Revelation. And uh, we had our, I did the talk for our, our wedding and it was, centered around the, how the sanctuary gives the keys to a happy marriage. So that was, uh, we both liked the sanctuary a lot. And so then uh, once we got married, then we started the ministry that we're doing now. And uh, I know that I've always wanted a time machine. And uh, so that's what we're building, building a time machine in a way. And uh, this is what it looks like. So we've, we've been, creating different Bible scenes in virtual reality. And this is a virtual reality headset. So the first one I started working on was the tabernacle. That one, that's my favorite theme. And so we built the tabernacle in virtual reality and then Noah's Ark. So we have the full 500 foot long boat and we have a creation science museum where there's fossils you can pick up, and dinosaurs walking around. Uh, that one is especially to appeal to the kids. And then we created the, one of the pre-flood underwater world. And the second temple this is the temple where Christ walked, did his miracles and taught. Uh, so we 
have the temple and the city of Jerusalem around it. And then we have Daniel chapter two and Daniel chapter seven. And uh, so when people, what we do is we go to, uh, especially like fairs, county fairs, state fairs, and we set up a booth and we invite people to come try the virtual reality. And so a lot of times it's either a group of kids or the kids with their parents and they come to our booth and we let them do the virtual reality. And then the other people are standing and waiting, either the parents or the other friends that have come. And so they're just standing around and waiting for their friends to be done. And so then we tell them about the books on the table. We have all these free books to give away. And so we tell them about the books and uh, then let them take whatever they'd like off the table. And we don't usually like hand the books to the people. We usually let them, we want them to be interested enough to pick them up themselves off the table and take them with them. Uh, so if they indicate that much interest, then they'll probably take them home with them. Otherwise, if we hand them books, they may just throw it away or something. So we want them to be interested enough to pick it up themselves. So these are different booths. Uh, my parents have also created uh, full-size replicas of the tabernacle furniture. And so this is one where we set up the virtual reality and the tabernacle furniture as well. Uh, and we've also been doing homeschool conferences. Uh, that's gone really well too because the people there are really spiritual, spiritually minded. They're usually deep Bible students. And so this was one where we had two booth spaces and we set up the tabernacle on one side and the virtual reality on the other side. And it, it really attracts the kids' attention, especially. Uh, we have pretty much an endless stream of kids through the entire day. And sometimes they'll sit around for like half hour, 45 minutes, uh, sitting around our booth in a line, just waiting for another opportunity to do the virtual reality. And so we get to spend a lot of time talking with them and getting to know them and uh, giving out books to the parents. Um, so this ministry has been going really well. Uh, we've been going to primarily fairs, but we also go to churches, schools, um, homeschool conferences, uh, creation, creation um, conferences, all kinds of different things like that. And each year we have thousands of people that go through the VR tours. And like this year, we gave away about 4,300 books. Uh, we did six fairs this year. And uh, this year was interesting. It was, people were especially interested in the books this year. We gave away more books than normal. Like each year, we keep track of how many books it's been at each fair. And a lot of the fairs have, were significantly more books than usual. So it seems like people are, are really feeling a need for spiritual things. Something is different than it was before. And so that's, that was interesting to see this year. And this is a quote that uh, I read this a while back. I think this was maybe before we started the ministry. I can't remember for sure. But this is, this is kind of um, a quote that's really inspiring to us doing the ministry. I'm gonna see if I can move this, this preview window so I can see the whole quote here. There we go. Okay, so um, this is from the book Evangelism says, I was given instruction that as we approach the end, there will be large gatherings in our cities, as there has recently been in St. Louis. This is talking about the St. Louis World's Fair that was happening there back in her time. And that preparations must be made to present the truth at these gatherings. When Christ was upon this earth, he took advantage of such opportunities. Wherever a large number of people were gathered for any purpose, his voice was heard, clear and distinct, giving his message. And as a result, after his crucifixion and ascension, thousands were converted in a day. The seed sown by Christ sank deep into hearts and germinated. And when the disciples received the gift of the Holy Spirit, the harvest was gathered in. And then it goes on. At every large gathering, some of our ministers should be in attendance. They should work wisely to obtain a hearing and to get the light of the truth before as many as possible. We should improve every such opportunity as that presented by the St. Louis Fair. At all such gatherings, there should be present men whom God can use. Leaflets containing the light of present truth should be scattered among the people like the leaves of autumn. To many who attend these gatherings, these leaflets would be as the leaves of the tree of life, which are for the healing of the nations. I send you this, I send you this my brethren, that you may give it to others. Those who go forth to proclaim the truth shall be blessed by him who has given them the burden of proclaiming this truth. The time has come when as never before, Seventh-day Adventists are to arise and shine 
because their light has come and the glory of the Lord has risen upon them. So that's, uh, that's been a really inspiring quote to us that she actually talks about the importance of, of going to large events like fairs and things like that. And uh, a lot of these fairs, there's hundreds of thousands of people. Uh, most state fairs, even if it's in small states, uh, there's like 300,000 some people. Um, we were down in Florida this last winter. In, in the wintertime, they have fairs down in Florida and in the northern areas, they have them in the summertime. And so this last winter we were in Florida and each of the fairs we went to down there had half a million people at it. And so people, God's people need to be there. And uh, at a lot of the fairs, like there's no other Adventists at all. There's not even very many other Christians. There are a few other Christians sometimes, but um, there's very few Adventists. It's a lot of the places that we go, the Adventists tell us, well, we've given up going to fairs. We've given up having a booth at the fair because it just doesn't doesn't accomplish anything but I think part of the reason is that people don't know how to do it um, they they just sit there they don't invite people they don't talk to the people that are passing by and they don't really have anything that catches the people's interest like you have to have if you're going fishing you have to have bait on your hook and you have to have something that the fish are interested in and so if you just have a bunch of books there and the people don't know anything about them they're probably not going to stop just for the books and so you have to have something else to kind of get them to stop. And the virtual reality has provided that. It's provided something that'll get the people to stop, especially the kids. Usually the kids, their parents stop with them. Um, so it's provided something. Once the people stop, then we can start talking to them, tell them about the books, and then, then we can engage them more. Then we can like um, get them interested in the books. So. It's been working really well. Um, it's been a real blessing to be part of it. And uh, we've tried to prepare it as we've been working on building the virtual reality and everything. We've tried to prepare it so that other people can do the same thing. That other people, if they wanna go to the fairs and set up a booth, uh, we can help them get started with the virtual reality if they wanna do that. Or if they wanna do something else, something else that they're interested in that, that they can use to get other people interested. Um, we can help share whatever knowledge we've gained. We've been doing this for more than six years now, um, doing this ministry of going to fairs and things. And uh, it's given, it's worked really, really well. And uh, so, yeah, we wanna be able to help other people do it too, if, they, if they'd like to. So the, the answer to whether you can walk on water is of course you can walk on water. And um, I've been, doing ministry for 12 years now. And almost all that time has been just working for God in whatever ways um, I feel called to, to work for him, not really worrying about whether, whether I'm gonna have money to do it, uh, how I'm gonna live, what I'm gonna live on. Um, I haven't been employed in any, by any other ministry or um, like working at a job or anything like that from almost all that time. And it's just been amazing how God's provided, how he's done things. And I've got enough stories for hours to <laughs> hours of, of sharing testimonies. Uh, and it's also been like, like being on the battlefield too. It's been like, especially the first fair of each year, it seems like Satan really attacks and tries to stop us, tries to discourage us and tries to get us uh, off track. And, and so we really have to kind of, prepare through prayer and prepare mentally, like knowing we're gonna encounter a lot of opposition, um, all, all sorts of trouble. We've had just all sorts of trouble trying to go to the fairs, especially the first one of the year. Sometimes it's like, if we push through and keep going through the, the trouble that he tries to throw at us for the first fair, then it's like God says, okay, you've, you've tested them, now you have to leave them alone. And so the rest of the fairs usually aren't quite as difficult, but. Uh, it's it's been an amazing experience, and uh, I think that as we near the end of time, uh, more and more people are going to have to start learning to walk on water, so to speak, because um, more and more people are going to be losing jobs. Um, they're going to have to trust God just for their just for their own living, as well as um, being able to do ministry. Like 
as fewer and fewer people have income and as the, as the money gets more scarce, there's not going to be as much money to go around. And people are going to have to just trust God, just go out and do ministry and trust God, uh, even if they don't have any assured uh, support. There may not be other ministries that'll that'll provide funding and provide employment and things like that. And so you just, if you want to work for God, you may have to just go out and start doing it and then trust God to take care of you. And uh, so I just wanted to share a few of the principles about walking on water that I've learned. First of all, it's important to really consider, is Christ calling you? Like Peter said, if it's you, tell me to come to you. And Christ called him. And so it's important to, to, to be sure that Christ is calling you, uh, that he wants you to do ministry. And if he calls you, it's important. If you're walking on water, you need to be careful. Like Peter, uh, the waves were rolling. It was stormy. It was a scary situation. Uh, a wave came deep between him and his master. He lost sight of Christ. Uh, he started getting scared. And he was also kind of, before that, he was kind of looking back at the boat, like, to see if his friends were watching him, like, look at me. I'm doing something pretty amazing here. And so pride can, when you're walking on water, you can sink pretty easily, whether you lose sight of Christ through the trials around you or through pride or whatever it is. Uh, when you're walking on water, you got to be careful because you're going to go down fast if, if you're not careful. And also being faithful in the little things. Um, it seems like that's what God was teaching me for the first several years of just barely living, like just providing just enough to get me through week by week and month by month and just barely having enough. Uh, he was teaching me to be faithful in the little bits of money that I had and to be really economical and to be to be very, very studious and very careful. And also being faithful with whatever you have at your disposal. Like uh, I didn't have much. I was I had an old computer to do ministry with. I had just the bare minimum. And I felt like it was kind of like Moses with his rod. God when God was going to tell him to go lead the people of Israel out of Egypt, that was like the mightiest nation on the earth. And here God was telling him, I want you to go rescue these slaves and take them out of, out of Egypt. And Moses had been a, a leader of the armies of Egypt before. And so he knew what it was like commanding huge bunches of people. And so he was thinking, okay, I'm probably going to need lots of swords and shields and chariots, and I'm going to need an army to rescue these people and, and all that. And God said, use the stick in your hand. He said, what's that in your hand? And all, all I, Moses had was his stick he had been carrying around for probably 80 years, his walking stick. And so God told him, take that stick and go deliver the people of Israel. And so it's important, a principle that I heard David Gates talking about, and I learned it in my experience too, is that God expects us to use whatever we have in our hand, and then he'll give us more if we're using what we already have. And we shouldn't just wait until we have a whole bunch of stuff. We shouldn't wait till we have millions of dollars, can afford to buy radio stations and television stations and things like that. We need to start small with whatever we already have. And as we prove ourselves faithful with that, God will provide us with more to work with. And then uh, also praising, praising God for what he's doing. That's another way that I've found that he works is... Um, by when I praise him for what he's doing publicly, then like telling the stories, telling the testimonies, what he's doing, the miracles he's doing, how he's providing, that's what inspires people to get excited and want to be part of it. And a lot of times it's through that that people send funds to, to help the work go forward. And also, like I talked about before, don't put dependence on humans. And also being ready for hardships and ready to sacrifice. There's been a lot of hardships, a lot of sacrifice, but uh, it's God just, he's so good to us and, and it's, it's all worth it, especially once we get to heaven and see all the results of it. Uh, so there's our email address and our website um, on the banner there. Um, so do we have, uh, should we share more stories or like of, of our experiences yeah. at the fairs? Yeah, that would be really nice to hear. Okay. Go ahead. Yeah. Okay, Megan, I'll start with stories here. Oh, good. 
there's lots of stories and they're really you know it's really encouraging when you're at the fair and you're working and you're like you feel like there's so much rejection and then someone comes and they're so excited about what you're offering and they're so excited to take a book or or they or you have a wonderful conversation with them and you're able to help them and you know it makes it feel like oh I am accomplishing something here and um one of those times was, this was a few years ago, we were in Montana at a big fair and um, this elderly couple took um, a book called Crisis in Siberia, which is about the Sabbath. And um, they came back again during the fair and they came up to our booth and they pointed at that book and they said, we read this book and we're going to be keeping the Sabbath. And they were so excited and so happy. And um, that was just amazing. Like we did nothing other than give them a book and here they were already convicted and ready to keep the Sabbath. And um, so that was pretty awesome. And um, let's see, another time um, there was this young boy that came into our, he came to our booth and he wanted to do the virtual reality and his dad, he kind of dragged his dad in and his dad didn't want to be there. And he was like, oh, okay, just make it quick, you know? And so we start talking to the dad and um, we start asking him, I don't remember what we asked him, this is years ago, but um, we were talking to him and he was telling us that, you know, oh, our parent, me and my wife, our parents never were religious. They never took us to church. I guess we just never got interested in it. And, you know, and, um, and I, I just pointed to the book Steps to Christ and I said, you know, if you want, if you're interested in learning about a personal kind of relationship with Jesus Christ, this would be a really good book for you. And um, I wasn't expecting him to pick it up because he just seemed very uninterested and very in a rush to get out of there. But he just grabbed it so suddenly and he said, I think I do. I think I am interested I think I need to stop chasing money and cars and bikes. And I think I need something else in my life. And that was just so exciting to me. Like you never, you never know what people are thinking or where their heart is at based on their, how they act, you know, and um, something that happened recently, well, sort of recently this year. Um, and let's see, in March, we were at, um, a fair in Miami, a big fair, and um, one of the fair workers that works the rides and stuff, he came to our booth a couple times and just, he was really visiting with us and he was telling us about his problems and things he was dealing with and going through in his life. And we were talking to him and he came back a third time and he told us that, um, he said, I just want you guys to know how much, you know, that the love that you've shown me and the way you've treated me, it's really changed my life. And I really see the love of God in you guys. And I know that you guys love people unconditionally, no matter, you know, where they come from or what they've done. And um, he was, he started to cry talking about how we had shown him love and it had changed him. And we were like, so shocked I guess because we didn't do anything unusual I mean we did love him we treated him with love and kindness we do that to everyone you know and um, we were just so surprised and so encouraged by that that you know it wasn't fruitless what we were trying to do there and um anyway um let's see what else um there's been experiences, people that came up to me and said, oh, I used to be into the Bible, but then I just had all these, I had too many unanswered questions and I would talk with them and ask them what questions they had. And I would, it was like God enabled me to answer their questions in a way that satisfied them. And they were so like, wow, I never thought about that, you know? And um, let's see, what else has happened? Do you want to share a story? Oh, maybe or I could tell about the van breaking down. Mm -hmm. Should I share that? Yeah. Another thing that happened, um, this was years ago too. We were in Minnesota um, near the Mayo Clinic at a fair, a big fair there. And um, 
I, uh, what we were starting to run out of books, which was a good thing because we were giving away a lot of books there. And um, so I was gonna take the van and I was gonna drive down to, I think to Minneapolis area to the ABC there. And I was gonna pick up more books and bring them back. And I thought it would only take me part of a day so I head down there and I get the books and I'm on my way back and like Minneapolis area is like really crazy. Like the traffic is, they're just all in a rush. They're very um, aggressive drivers, it's scary. And um, anyway, I was on my way back and all of a sudden it's like, I start losing power. Like the van is just, it's like I'm not getting power when I press the, the gas and it's like just slowing down. And I'm like, uh oh, what is this? And the battery light is blinking. And I'm like, oh no, what is going on here? So I knew that I was having trouble. I was having van or I was having vehicle problems. And I was like, I started to pray. And I was like, Lord, please lead me to a mechanic shop or somewhere I could get help before this van quits on me. So I pulled off on the very first exit that I saw and I was like looking like which way should I turn I can go right or left and I don't see anything that looks like anything. And I'm praying like where should I go and so I turn right and I'm looking around me and I'm like, you know, this is all residential like it's only houses there's no businesses there's nothing here I can feel the van like slowing more and more like it's really gonna quit now. All of a sudden, I look on my right hand side, and there's a mechanic shop in the middle of all these houses. I pull in there, and as soon as I get in there, the van quits. It will not go any further. <laughs> and they got me in, and they got me all fixed up and back on the road that evening. And I got back to the fair, and um, he provided the money too to fix it because it was a lot of money. I think it was 600 some dollars, which we didn't have that much at the time. We were really poor back then. We have a little bit more to work with now. But um, anyway, I got back to the fair and um, Marianne McNeilis came and helped run the booth that day. So that was kind of neat. And um, anyway, we get back, I got back to the fair and one of the next days at the fair, this guy comes to our booth. There's a lot of Muslims in this area where the Mayo Clinic is, um, the Rochester Fair. Anyway, this guy comes to our booth and I start engaging him and talking to him. And he tells me, he's like, well, I'm a cultural Muslim, but when I went to college, I learned that everything's relative in the universe. There's really no absolute truth. There's really no God. Like, you know, that's what I believe now. I'm a, I'm a cultural Muslim. And so I start kind of debating him, not in a mean way, but just explaining that, you know, there are laws of how the universe works. You can see it in nature. You can see it in how things work in the world. And he was disagreeing with me and saying that not even gravity is absolute. And he was just really skeptical. And so I started telling him um, different things. I started sharing my testimonies with him of things God has done in my life. And I told him about the van quitting on me and how God made sure I got to a mechanic shop right as it quit. And um, he looked at me and he said, now that is a miracle. And he was like so convinced by that. And um, it was just amazing. It was like a day or two later after I had this experience, I was able to share it with someone who needed to hear it. And um, it was just really incredible. And um, Let's see, there's another time where we were at a homeschool conference and um, I was this kind of middle-aged, real dignified looking man comes up to our booth and I start telling him about the books on the table. I think I told him a little description of probably three or four different books. I think one was Great Controversy. And, um, and he was, you know, he was listening, but he didn't seem interested. He seemed very, like, really bored. Like, he couldn't wait to get out of there. Like, I was just boring him to death, telling him about these books. And that happens sometimes. And you just, they leave and you move on to the next person. You know, you can't give it too much thought. But um, I thought, surely he's just going to walk away. He's not going to take any of these books that I'm telling him about. And so I get to the end of my description. and. He's like, well, you sold me, I'll take all of them. <laughs> so he took all the books that I told him about 
That was pretty neat because it encouraged me that you don't know what people are thinking. You really don't. They might seem so uninterested, but just do it anyway, because sometimes they are interested. And um, anyway. One example of that is at the Florida Fair, the booth across the aisle from us was the um, Florida Department of Corrections. And the, there was a young guy that uh, I think he worked he worked at the public Florida Public Direct um, Department of Corrections, and he didn't seem that religious, but he he was really friendly. Like he'd come over and visit just about every morning or so. And I didn't remember him taking patriarchs and prophets earlier on in the fair, but later he came back and he said he wanted prophets and kings. He said I already finished reading patriarchs and prophets. <laughs> so he I don't remember how many how long it had been, but like he worked at the fair almost all the time. He had very little free time. He had told us kind of what his schedule was. And, and so he had very little free time. And apparently he filled that free time with reading uh, Patriarchs and Prophets. And so he had finished it and he came back to get some more later on during the fair. So he was one of those people where I, I never would have expected. And I was really surprised to find out he had already finished it. There was another time too, this lady came to a fair, I think it was in Montana maybe. And she came on the first day and the fair would last till 11 o'clock at night and so then the fair would end and we'd all go home and so she picked up Desire of Ages and she said she started reading it at midnight and she finished by four o'clock the next morning and I think she must have been a speed reader like some people where they can just scan an entire page without having to read the words but however she did it she read the entire Desire of Ages just in a few hours just that one night and so that was pretty amazing. It's it's neat when people come back and tell you that they've read the books. And uh, there's another guy that he came back and he was telling us he'd gotten Patriarchs and Prophets the previous year. And then he came back and I was asking him what he'd read in it. And he was telling me about like how he'd read about the um, origin of evil and the fall of Lucifer and different things. And so I could tell he had been reading it. Uh, so it's it's neat when when you start to see a little bit of fruit from the the things that you're doing like a lot of times we're, we're planting lots of seeds but we don't know where the books go we don't know what happens with them and we know like Ellen White tells us that that these books go into people's homes and there are seeds waiting for the time when the people need them and there's angels there to protect the books and to bring them to people's attention and everything but uh, sometimes we we don't really see much happening but it's neat when we do get to the next year or or whenever it is we get to kind of see some fruit from the books going out. The Florida State Fair, the fair workers. Yeah, at the, the Florida State Fair, uh, we, I was, I was, I went to the, the restroom and I, I saw one of the guys come in, one of the workers, one of the, the guys that works like in cleaning and janitor work and stuff like that. He came in and I saw he had a Bible and he had a, some other books and he had been to our booth apparently. And so he came up and he was telling the other guy, the other worker, uh, which later I found out was the boss of all the workers. He was telling him about these books. He said, I got these free books. I got this free Bible. And, and this guy said, well, look up this verse. And then he told him, look up that verse. And he was having him read these verses to him. And, and apparently the, the guy was a Christian that he was, that he was showing his books to. And uh, so that guy, he came to our booth later and he got some books. And then he told all the workers that they should come to our booth and get books. And so during the, the time that we were there, these workers kept coming over and over and um, getting books. And then sometimes during the night, like we tell the people, uh, the workers or the security guards, we tell them, if you need something to read during the night while you're here, just pick up whatever you want. And so there was quite a few times we'd come back and like the Bibles were gone or different other books were gone. We could tell somebody had been there and was looking through the books and picking stuff up. So that was pretty neat. And you never would have guessed it. Like a lot of these people, they're pretty rough looking people. And we found out it's it's like a drug and alcohol rehabilitation program. So these people are, they're, they're given a job working at the fair to help them to, to get back into normal life and get off of drugs and alcohol. And it's a Christian program. And so that's why the, the lead guy, he was really into the Bible and everything. And so we were, they were telling us their testimonies and different things and how they, God had saved them from drugs and alcohol. And it's just really neat. And we never would have expected it when we were signing up, uh, getting our badges for the fair, the first day before it started. 
we were in line with all these people. These are kind of rough looking characters and we weren't sure like, who are these people? And we were a little bit nervous. We were surrounded by these <laughs> rough looking people and we were scared, but they were our best customers. Yeah. And then at the end of the fair, see during the fair, there was this guy that was like this cool dude that had a booth and at, at the fair and we saw him and he would always be walking past our booth and he had these like little beer things on his sunglasses. And he was like playing this loud rap music at his booth and everything. And when we were on the last day, when we were packing up our booth, he approaches us and starts talking to us about how he needs to get right with God and like whatever we can give him to help him get right with God, he'll take it. And how, and he even said something like he was looking at us and he was like, your hearts are right or something like that. Like, it was just so like <laughs> somebody that seems so worldly, but you know, we gave him a chance and he was just so sincere and just, it was like, he just appreciated us so much. And that just, it made my day to see that, you know? And, um, and then there's people that I think were working with him that, well, he came back to us and brought us a donation and then there were other people working with him that came up to us as well during that time and were like, you know, what can you give me to help me get right with God? And they gave us donations and they were just so excited. And um, it was just amazing. I love, those are my favorite ones when people that really seem worldly have such a sincere desire for truth and they're so appreciative. Um, that just makes my day. It really brings me joy. and. Um, yeah um let's see what else um at the north dakota state fair this summer um this little girl approached our booth and she was really little i mean i would be surprised that she could read but we have this brochure called um who is jesus and what does he have to do with me and it's for people that really don't know much about jesus and she picked that up and she asked me why is it called that and i i said well it's for people who don't know much about jesus and she said well i don't know much about jesus and she starts looking through it and she points to jesus on the cross and says is this real because my mommy says it's a made-up story and i told her yes it's real and i know that for a fact and she said how do you know and i i told her well because God has changed my life. I used to be unhappy and sad and angry and he, he's given me joy and happiness and love in my heart because I asked him to and you can ask him for that too and he'll do that for you. And, um, and she asked me, why did he have to die? Why did Jesus have to die? And I said, well, because um, all the terrible and bad and wrong things that we do, he took the punishment for us. He died for, for our mistakes and the bad things that we do. And she said, why? Because he was too nice. And I said, yeah, because he loves us and likes us and thinks we're special and wants to make us happy. And then she starts asking me about, well, but is he God or who is God and Jesus? And he, she was confused about what how is Jesus related to the father? So I was trying to explain that in simple terms. And she was asking me one thing after another. She asked me, when did that happen? And I said, 2000 years ago. And she's like, wow, that's a long time. <laughs> and then her mom showed up and I was like nervous because apparently her mom's an atheist and here her daughter is at this Christian booth taking literature from them. And, and she said to her mom, um, I want this, the brochure, she, she wanted it. She's like, I want to take this because I don't know much about Jesus. And I was surprised her mom was nice about it. She said, that's fine. So they left. And, but it was so amazing to be the first person to tell a little girl about Jesus. I, I don't know if I've ever had that happen to me before, but that was so neat. And, um, there's just been, there's been so many neat, neat experiences, neat conversations, people taking books you never would have thought that they would take, and uh, people taking huge bag full, bags full of books, and just, you know, 
it's just amazing. It's like, I love, I love doing this ministry. I love seeing people's lives impacted. I mean, we don't get to see much of the long term usually, but we see the light come on in their eyes and we see that they're interested in this book and we're able to show the love of God to them. And it's very, very precious thing to me. We could tell stories for a really long time, but we should probably see if, if anybody has questions or we don't want to take up all the time here. Oh, wow. That, those were amazing stories. <laughs> yeah, we could think about a part two in the future. <laughs> yeah, and yeah, we definitely have lots and lots of stories that we can tell. Because you're going to have more stories as you keep doing more affairs. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Where'd we were at a next? camp meeting. What did uh -huh. you say? Go ahead. Oh, we were at a camp meeting recently, and it was out in Montana, and um, the, the conference president was there. He was having the, the meetings, and he was telling stories of being in the mission field and stuff. And he said, uh, if you want to experience miracles, go work for God, because that's, that's where God does a lot of his miracles. And that's definitely what we found, is that almost all the stories, the testimonies that we have to share, it's all from working for God, the things that he does when you're working for him. And um, we just see miracles on a, a regular basis, going to the fairs and, and him providing the books and the expenses for the fairs and just everything. It's just really amazing. Amen. Sean, what is your what email is your... address again? Uh, Sean, and then the number four, mm -hmm. and then Jesus at gmail.com. I shared the. the yeah, right? that's right. Mm -hmm. I shared the um, website already. Yeah. In the chat. If you, if everybody saw that. Yeah. So. If anybody else is interested in um, doing similar ministry, if they want to use the virtual reality, uh, we've just been giving away to anybody that wants the software. Uh, the equipment is kind of expensive, uh, but the software we can just give to anybody uh, oh. that wants to use it. Uh, we're excited if anybody wants to do similar ministry because it's been working really well and it's it's kind of sad not seeing other people out at the fairs mm. um, I know it's difficult for people because they're busy and but a lot of these places it'd be nice if at least if the state fairs like if the the conference could send somebody to be at the fairs mm -hmm. like we out in Montana we were visiting with the Jehovah's Witnesses and uh I mean, this was just a county fair. It wasn't even the state fair, but uh, they said they had a hundred people to run one booth for like the seven days or whatever it was of the fair. And I was like, wow, <laughs> they've got a hundred people to run one booth. <laughs> there's no Adventists here at all, except for us. I mean, we, we came there from all the way from North Dakota. Um, if we hadn't been there, there wouldn't have been any Adventists at all. The, the Adventists in the area told us they gave up on doing fairs because it wasn't. Aww accomplishing much they felt like and so yeah i just feel like uh we're way behind on <laughs> on doing evangelism um there's a lot of other people that are way ahead of us the, yeah when we go to the fairs there's always the the catholic pro-life booth there's the the gideons a lot of times are there the Jehovah's witnesses are a lot of times there wow um, there's others that are sometimes there but uh, it's rare for churches to show up um, wow especially churches. wow the only thing that i've done is um like i'm one of those people that you know came out of the world and was like really troubled like a truly troubled person before so um you know i uh came up with this idea or maybe god gave me this idea but i made my testimony into a threefold brochure that i can just print out <laughs> Mm -hmm. And so we have that with our other brochures and it has a picture of me when I was a teenager before I knew Jesus. And it says from troubled teen to loving Christian, my story. And mm -hmm. so um, anyway, that's something it's quick. It's like quick to read, but it's mm -hmm. something that people can see, you know, my story that's real and it's mine and mm -hmm. they can read it. You know? So I feel like that would be something that a lot of people could probably do that same thing, you know, write their story out and give it to people, you know. Mm -hmm. Very few people will refuse to read your story. 
Yeah. Everybody likes reading stories. And if you hand them your story and say, this is something from me, this is my own story. Yeah. Uh, just about everybody would love that. And that's, that's the most powerful thing that we have is our testimony. It's so true. Amen. Well, I mean, look at the, the broken down van story that convinced the Muslims. <laughs> mm -hmm. Personal testimonies are so powerful. Yeah. Yeah. On one of our trips, we stopped overnight at an Airbnb and it ended up being a, a, an atheist. Uh, he called himself like a real hardcore atheist or something like that. Militant atheist. Yeah. He said, I am a militant atheist. <laughs> wow. He was a really nice guy and he just loved to debate Christianity versus atheism. And we ended up staying up till midnight um, talking with him. And he was real nice about it. Like he wasn't mean or anything like some are. But um, it was like I had just been studying um, like creation science and all the scientific evidence. So I had all this stuff in fresh in my mind. But it was like none of the science, none of the facts and information made any dent on his atheism. And it, he, like, it wasn't like, it was like we weren't getting anywhere with, with intellectual information that we were sharing with him until we started sharing the stories of what God had done in our ministry and the miracles he had done to take care of us and stuff. And uh, then he was leaning forward on his chair and he said, now that's really compelling evidence. And that it's like surprising because, uh, it's not like a scientific double blind study. It's just a subjective personal experience, but it has more power than all the facts and information that. Yeah. That Amen. yeah that's, there's been a number of times like that where people are so skeptical, you can't convince them at all. And then you share a testimony and they're like, well, that's a miracle from God. Mm -hmm, you know? mm -hmm. Yes, that's so, right. Yeah. So anyway. Um, we have can I share another another experience that we yeah. had? So um, we were in Tennessee. We were at a fair in Tennessee, um, the Claiborne County Fair up by Kentucky. And um, this was just really recent here, um, like, I don't know, a month or a few weeks ago. Anyway, one day we came back from the fair and we were like, oh, we're out of drinking water in our motel. And the water there is like not drinkable. So we were like, we had to run to the grocery store and get some gallons of drinking water. And um, it was like 11 o'clock. Yeah, night it was like really late. It was dark. And so anyway, we were like really frustrated. Like we need to go to sleep. We're tired. We've been working at the fair, but we were like, okay. So we get back in the vehicle and we go to the, the grocery store down the road and we're coming out of the store. And I saw this young lady who was like walking by herself, like way out toward, like, I didn't know where she was going because she must have been parked way far away. And I was looking at her and I was like, I felt, I don't know, like, I just felt like I needed to follow her. I don't know if it was from God or it was just an idea, but I felt really strongly about it. So I start following this girl and she's not going to the parking lot. She's going out to the road. She's like, really, she's going to walk home, apparently. So I start following her, but she is like moving too fast. Like, I can't keep up with her. I can't, I can't catch up. So I start running and um, she turns around like I was like chasing her. So she turns around and looks at me and um, she starts coming toward me. So then I was like, it hadn't even occurred to me what I was going to say if I caught up with her. So then mm -hmm. I, I just blurted out, um, do you need a ride? You know, and, and she was just like her whole face lit up. She was so happy and so thankful that we wanted to give her a ride. And um, so I brought her over to the vehicle and um, we only had two seats in the van because the whole back is for our stuff, our ministry equipment. So Sean crouched in the back and me and her were up front and she just starts talking to us and telling us like how much she loves God's word and that she writes poems for God and like reads them in churches and, and she was just so thankful. She kept saying over and over how happy she was that she didn't have to walk home in the dark and mm. Anyway, when we got to her place, we were like loading her down with bags of food and stuff and um. And she was like telling us like, sometimes I just feel so worthless and like my kids are better off without me, but this is a sign. Mm. <laughs> and, um, 
And then she saw, I started to give her a steps to Christ and she was so happy about that. Like, oh, I love to read. I love reading. And, mm. and then she saw another book. I don't know what book it was. Christ, Christ yeah. Object Lessons was in the door, like in the pocket on the door on her side. And she saw that and she was like, oh, can I have this too? Oh, and praise the Lord. Gave her that. Did we give her another? I feel like we I almost thought there was three of them. I think we maybe her gave her them. three books because she was just so happy and so excited. Wow. And and it was just such a wonderful thing. Like I felt like she truly was so encouraged by our effort, I guess, or our attention to her and trying to help her. And she just seems so encouraged that, that God loves her and hasn't given up on her. And and um, it really encouraged us too. It was like, wow, God really orchestrated that. Mm -hmm. Definitely. Yeah, the water. You needed water. <laughs> yeah, he worked that out, I guess, somehow. <laughs> Amen. Praise yeah. the Lord. Mm -hmm. Philip says to pray for him because he was talking to a fellow church member about doing a reformation booth for Halloween for a Halloween fair on Main Street. So yeah, it looks like he's exciting, quoting but... something that you said, Sean, because both feet first, right? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's a good idea. Yeah, make sure you have lots of good books relating to Halloween and the Reformation. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah. Amen. That one, uh, the, the great controversy with the Reformation, Martin Luther nailing the 95 Theses to the door would be a great one. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I've heard of Adventists dressing up as as uh, Martin Luther on Halloween. Really? <laughs> yeah, I, I think giving out maybe candy at the door or something. I'm not sure. So yeah, at the booth. That would be an interesting thing to do that at a booth. Mm -hmm. Dress up like Martin Luther and give out mm -hmm. great controversies at a booth. <laughs> yes. Is there, a, is there a book that has to do with like? ghosts and like the state of the dead and like I don't know of a good book like that but you could even write make a brochure about it you know write make like a little bible study in brochure form or give out track maybe a tract you know yeah something yeah. something mm -hmm. about the state of the dead would be great yeah that would be really good something that brings in the Halloween thing mm -hmm. into, you know I think amazing facts I know they might just have a website but I, I wonder if they have a magazine they do have a magazine on life after death. I'm pretty sure. So, yeah. I think that Harvest Time Books maybe has a little pocket yes. size book on Halloween. Halloween. That's more about the dangers and the, the bad side of the evils of Halloween. But uh, I'm sure there's something about the state of the dead out there too that would be really mm -hmm. great for, for Halloween. There's probably like a glow tract or a, you know, one of those. Little yes. Um, yeah. But there, there are, they put out special glow tracks at that time of year. Oh, okay. What were you saying? Maybe. Oh, um, well, Sean made a brochure about alien encounters and it just, it talks about the state of the dead and the aliens are, you know, they're actually demons and, you know, so something similar to that, you know, like it kind of people are curious about it and then they read it and they're they get to see what the bible says you know mm -hmm. amen yeah that is so true that sounds good does anybody else have any questions that they wanted to ask sean and megan mm -hmm. yes Bye, Wendy. Nice to have you on. We're so glad you could join us. Bye. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's um. Thankfully, this is recorded, so other people can watch it later who are on different time zones. Yeah. So, with the ones that join, we're very thankful that you could and that you stuck with us to the end. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Definitely. Yes. Well, I think that the people were blessed. You know, I'm always, it's always somebody different every Friday night. So I know it's the people that God wants to be on because they need to hear someone's particular mm -hmm. story. So um, I'm really glad for those that came on to hear your story. Yeah. 
So yeah, thank you for inviting us to share. Yes, yeah, I thank know you that, for having us. Yes, so I know you are an inspiration to those, and I know that God will have others watching the YouTube um, video later, and will be able to inspire somebody else. Yeah. So, so it goes. Does it go from Zoom onto YouTube then? Uh huh. Yeah. So it's recording okay. right now, and okay. then we'll upload it. So. Okay. Yes. So Melanie Hubbard said, to, thank you for sharing your story with us. Yeah, mm -hmm. you're welcome. <laughs> yes. Wow. Definitely, we want to have you back on sometime in the future. because we want to... When's your next fair? Um, the next ones will be down in Florida again. Uh, that okay. That starts in February and then going into March. Okay. We have like small events kind of from now. Like we've been doing kind of small events on weekends. Uh, but the, the fairs down in Florida are in the winter, and then come summer, then we start doing the fairs up in the northern states. Okay. And what do you do with your time in between when you're not doing fairs? Uh, mostly work on new new materials, new virtual reality experiences, um, and then do other little events. Like the homeschool conferences are usually in the winter time, and uh, we've been having other like kind of weekend small weekend things like the camp meetings and the um, different other churches. So various times we get invitations from different uh, like non amethyst churches and schools and different places. Uh, there's a school in Tennessee that wants us to come down. Uh, there's uh, to this uh, tomorrow evening, uh, Sabbath evening, uh, the Seventh Day Church of God is wanting us to come for having like a I don't know, youth thing or something they want, they're having activities and stuff for people. And so they want us to bring the virtual reality for them. Uh, so that's, that's nice. nice to have opportunities like that. Amen. If you all have the time, it would be nice if you can join the Evangel Living Facebook page and then the same testimonies that you post on your Facebook page, you can just copy and post, post them copy and paste them onto the mm -hmm. a post on evangel living so that people can read them <laughs> yeah that would be nice we don't get a lot of uh time like usually at the fairs i'm like trying to post stuff while i'm eating my lunch and mm -hmm. um, don't get a lot of time to post stuff but yeah that would be nice yes well you can think about it and see because um, yeah they are a blessing so well, good. Praise the Lord. That was fun. Yeah. Really. Thank you for uh, having us. We love it. It would be so fun to come to a fair with you all one time. Mm -hmm. Yeah. In Florida. You do it in Florida. Where in Florida? Uh, the first one's in Tampa. That's the state fair. And then the other one is in uh, Miami. That one's the Miami-Dade Youth Fair. The first yeah. one is 12 days. Uh -huh. Second one's 21 days. You, you, you're there every day, 12 days? Yeah. Long? Whoa. Yeah. <laughs> the, the second one is not as, as bad because it's, since it's such a long one, there's not as many people coming through as fast. Like, we get about as worn out on the 12 day one as we do on the 21 day one <laughs> because it's the, at the 12 day one, it's a lot of people. It's like half a million people coming through in 12 days. Wow. And so, we last year we had to have help at the the state fair, which is the twelve day one, because it was too much for the two of us. So some friends came and helped us. Mm. So between all of us, uh, we were able to do it fairly well, but we we're all tired by the end because mm. it's intense. Like you're mm -hmm. going for ten hours every day, or sometimes longer for seven to the, seven days to twelve days, or the one is the really long one is twenty one days. Wow, that's um you said it's in the winter yeah yeah february right. and march is the when you the go florida fairs yeah yeah we'll keep it in mind i'll have to talk to my husband and yeah and, and see if we could come down there that would be fun yeah it's yeah. nice it's nice when we have help because it just I lightens can. our load and mm -hmm. yes. makes it easier Oh, that would be, yeah, that's another reason why you could make posts on Events and Living, you know, and because you can make posts about your ministry and um, and also help people, inviting people to come help. They might yeah. enjoy doing it as a mission trip. 
you know and mm-hmm. then they could come down for a few days or whatever yeah yeah, so, yeah that would be nice mm-hmm. yeah yeah definitely so wow amazing i i have been blessed definitely oh praise the lord yes very grateful <laughs> Yeah, well, thank you so much for inviting us. And You're welcome. Yeah. It was my pleasure. It was nice to being able to meet you, Megan, and get to know you a yeah. little. Your stories. I like the way you're a good storyteller. I, I, well, can, <laughs> I can see the Lord has prepared you and um, sharing with the people at the booth. Um, well, praise but, the Lord. <laughs> yeah. Um, so that's really nice. So yeah I'm so thankful for the talents that he's given you sean that you can use for him so i think yeah, it's thank you amazing yeah oh, the same for my daughter that she'll dedicate her talents to him because mm-hmm. he he can cause the youth to go so far yeah yeah especially mm-hmm. when they start young mm-hmm. and uh, if they don't mess up their life yeah first they can like they have so much potential yes anybody has potential but yes especially young people they do so that's inspiring (laughs) well then let's close with a word of prayer okay yeah megan would you pray for us okay okay thank you Dear loving Father, thank you so much that we could spend time together talking about all the things that you've done for us Mm -hmm. and um, all the amazing miracles you do. And um, we pray for a wonderful blessing on this Sabbath day. And uh, we pray that the people that heard our testimonies will be inspired and will be able to go and be fruitful and doing lots of ministry for you. Thank you, and we pray these things in the name of Jesus. Amen. 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 (laughs) Okay, well, we look forward to when we can talk again and hear more stories. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we'd love to share more. Yes, I'll I'll look for them on um, your Facebook. (laughs) For those of you, um, you know, I know Philip's still on and those who are going to hear. I'm sure that you can always friend them on Facebook so you can follow yeah. their stories. <laughs> and if, if you see any stories you want to copy and paste onto the evangelist. That's true. Evangelism, Maybe um, you're I welcome can to do that. copy and paste stuff. <laughs> or, Maybe or, uh, uh-huh. I don't know if you could share it because usually I don't have it public on my page, but I can just yeah, copy, copy and, and paste. Them, whatever. Yeah. Since I have your permission, I can always do that. Yeah. That mm-hmm. sounds good. That would yeah. be nice. And I can just always link your uh, website with it. So if yeah, if you'd like to. Mm-hmm. Definitely. I was so glad that the person on Adventure Living shared it. I said, oh, didn't even know. What is her name? Linda Carney. Hmm. You know who she is? I thought the name sounds familiar. Yeah. I can't remember, though, who She's she is. She's the one who shared it. She's the elderly lady. Linda Carney. Yep. Okay. So she already... Hmm. She, she knows about you. Okay. <laughs> yeah, the name sounds familiar. I can't remember for sure. We met so many people in so many different places. <laughs> I can imagine. Yeah. <laughs> mm-hmm. All right. Well, God bless you both. Yeah. You thank you. Yeah. God bless you care. too, Philip. Yeah. God bless Philip. Come to UG Pines. You're we, you're welcome here to. We can um put you up. Take care of your stay here if you can come visit. It would be so nice for you to come and bring your equipment and then we do some kind of um, outreach with it. Yeah, that would be nice. Yeah. We passed we passed through those states very various times. So maybe one of the times maybe we can stop and that would be nice. Visit there. Yeah, I heard that we would really like that. We have the new church, you know. Yeah, I heard about that. Yeah. Yeah, so, Philip was actually telling me about that. Oh, yeah. really? Yeah. Cool. Good stuff. Yeah, we'd like to stop again and see who's there that we might still know. Yes, yes. Please come. <laughs> well, you enjoy your Sabbath then. And Thank you. You night. too.
Okay, good night. Okay, good night.